Brothers and sisters, I have good news for you this morning. This is good news that isn't new from a story that's ancient but never old. So at this time, I invite you to lean in, listen well, and listen carefully to these words from Holy Scripture from the Gospel of Mark. This is chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large crowds that there was no more room, not even outside the door. And Jesus preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they couldn't get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he turned to the man and he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Some teachers of the law were sitting there, and they, thinking to themselves, said, Why is this fellow talking like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, for me to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up. Take your mat and go home. The man got up, took his mat, and walked out in front of them all. Everyone was amazed by this. And they praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, I don't know if you noticed, there's no praying going on in there. But we're going to talk about this. We're still talking about intercessory prayer. An intercessor, for those of you who don't know that word or someone who intercedes, is someone who goes between, someone who does something for somebody else on their behalf. There are some other definitions you need to know. In Jesus' time, there were, and maybe in our time too, there were different understandings of ailments or problems. If you had a physical disease, that was called a disease, and to fix that, you were cured. So the word there is cured. If you had another type of ailment, a spiritual ailment, a relational ailment, if something was wrong, that was called healing. Jesus, in this story, does both. He cures the physical ailment, and he restores the man. He heals him. Uh, he restores him to his community. I have lots of questions about this. Now, initially, we all, didn't you all go, oh, yeah, I know this story, right? How many of you go, yeah, I know this story? Know this story, right? You could tell it if you had to in a children's sermon, right? Right? That day may come, right? Um, so I started thinking about this. Who are these guys? And they're actually more than four because this big group of them come and how many are carrying the man? How many? Four. Four. So there's more. Did they have to rotate in between? Did they get tired? How far did they have to bring this man? And of course, then how far did that man have to walk to get home? Right? 
Doesn't say they came from next door, keep the noise down, you got a big crowd here, oh, we're gonna bring this guy. So they brought this man, they carried him. Who was this man? He was probably in some way kin to them because that's the way communities were back then. Isn't that a lot like here? Right? I, I say, oh, so-and-so, and they're like, well, she's so-and-so's cousin's in-law. You know, we're all like that. I don't know if that's the South. I see that all over the place. So there are all these kinships, and some of us are members of y'all's family because you love us, right? You've taken us in. It doesn't have to be a blood relationship or a marriage. But this paralyzed man, what power did he have with his friends, right, with his family, that they would do this? I mean, can you imagine the dust and the trudging and the carrying? I don't know, could he speak at all? Could he move at all? And what happened to him? Was it a sickness? Was it a disease like polio? Was it a stroke? What caused the paralysis? How long had he been paralyzed? We don't know any of these answers. Of course, I'm, the more I dig, the more questions I have. We don't know any of that. So what do we know? Well, we know that Jesus healed him. We, he, he healed that man of, for the sins. We all need that kind of healing. Jesus went to the cross for us. He interceded for us. And in Romans 8, we read that Jesus is our intercessor with God. He sits on the right hand of the Father, and Jesus intercedes with us before the throne, or for us before the throne. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us by interpreting our prayers, because even in our best day, we're just not that good, right? We're not perfect. We're not on God's level. So the Holy Spirit is our intercessor. But we call this act of praying for other people intercessory prayer. But the real intercessor is Jesus. So what are we asked to do? You all figured this out already, didn't you? Nod your head if you have this. Yeah. We bring people to Jesus. That's what we do. That's our role. We bring people to Jesus. And what can we bring them for? You know, like what sorts of issues? For this man, he had a sin issue as well as a physical issue. And we know that, right? Sometimes a physical ailment has a spiritual or emotional or um, psychiatric root. It's not always just a physical thing. And sometimes it is related to sin. Think about the effects of different addictions, right? Unhealthy eating, lack of exercise. Um, think about um, some cancers. I mean, there are lots of things, diabetes, that can be related to behavior. So it's still true. Would you agree with that? It's still true. There, some of us need healing on more than one level. And Jesus can do all of that. What about studying for a test? Can we bring that to Jesus? What about, what about trouble with a neighbor or with a family member? Not that that would ever happen. Right? What about um, uh, there's so much noise I can't sleep tonight. What about that? Noise in my head, noise outside. Can we bring that to God? What about big things? The world's in an uproar, right? Kingdoms fall. Can we bring that? Here's what Paul reminds us in Philippians. He says, don't be anxious about anything. Did you hear that? Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, make your requests known to God. Present your requests to God. So anything. Your toe hurts. Go ahead, all right? Let somebody know, because the man didn't carry himself. The man didn't lower himself. Let people know. And that's, you remember a few weeks back when we said that perfect love casts out all fear? To be open with one another, to be transparent with our hurts, to be transparent with our cares. And sometimes it's just one trusted person. Sometimes you don't want to do it for the whole congregation. I get that. I get that. But 
in every situation, we can let God know that. And the peace of Christ that passes all understanding will guard our hearts and minds. And sometimes we need that. So we know what we're supposed to do, right? We're supposed to bring people to Jesus. Now how are we to do it? How do they do it? I made a list because that's who I do. That's what I do. Um, So how did they do it? They did it together. They were in a group. Wherever two or more are gathered, I've heard that said in this building, right? Wherever two or more are gathered in Jesus' name, bring somebody into your prayer time. Um, They brought somebody who was cast out. Look for people that you might not usually pray for. Be open to them. This man, Lucas, just came to me. I was working at Mass Door yesterday. Just came to me. I've had people come up to me and say, um, my brother is in the hospital and and you need to pray for him. I've never met them, (laughs) right? Does this happen to you too when you're open? People will come to you. And it's not an age thing. Young people pray very effectively. I mean, young people and young people both pray very effectively. Um, Also, when they brought that person back, he was restored. At that time, if you had a paralysis, maybe because it could be related to a contagious disease, those folks were kept separate from the community. When Jesus said, go home, he meant go home, be loved, be part of that community again. So they did it for that person, but they also did it for the community. That community was also restored because someone was missing, someone who was loved and important, because why else would that man be carried however far to come to Jesus? We're using those guys as a model, persistent. Would you say they were persistent? Yeah. Can't get it this way. You know, you can't go, isn't there a song about that? Can't get in through the door, right? But um, so they go up onto the roof and dig through the roof. So I'm not quite sure how they knew where Jesus was, right? That they were digging in the right place, that stuff didn't land on them. I don't know. But persistent and creative right? So we can pray without ceasing, but to be creative about it. And I'm going to give you an opportunity in a few minutes. We can do all things through Christ. We can pray and gather. We can do that. Gosh, even in a pandemic, we can find a way to gather. Can we not? We can still be tight. We can still be in fellowship. Even then, we can find a way to love people who are hateful to us. Um, We can accept people who are nothing like us. We can love each other. We can be still in a storm. Be creative. God made you in God's image. And part of that image is creativity. These folks were committed. They were loving. Right? Jesus saw their faith. Now, some scholars translate that. Not as faith, but as loyalty. And some assume that that means loyalty to Jesus, that they showed up at this house. And it was a house. It wasn't a synagogue, from what I've read. But what if that loyalty was to that man? I think that might be what it is. Jesus saw their loyalty to this man, and because of their love, they didn't heal this man. Jesus healed the man. But their love and their commitment to that man is important. Um, So the job of a prayer is to bring them to Jesus, and maybe they need a cure, and maybe they need healing. We don't know. Um, I want to talk to you before we do our practice moment. Um, What are the effects? What are the effects of prayer? Does this really work? Raise your hand if you've seen it work, if you know of somebody who has been healed or helped by prayer. Okay. We haven't all seen, like, the physical evidence. But it does happen. And you don't have to trust me. You can trust Duke University, if you prefer that. Um, For uh, a study that they did, a double-blind study, which means the doctors and and medical caregivers did not know 
The patients did not know. Um, they set up this study where people would pray for the patients, half of the patients in the cardiac care unit. Those patients, that half of the cardiac care unit, had 50% fewer complications in their recovery from surgery. So it works, even if you haven't seen it in other places. And you can look that uh, study up online, but I've been hearing about that for years. Um, for the prayers, as a, so that's the prayees, for the prayers, we are changed, are we not? When we are in constant communication with God, because that's what prayer is, we are changed. We become more attuned, more aware of what God wants. So, my friend's mother is 90, and she was not thriving. She just was not, she just wasn't doing well. Her weight was dropping. She was depressed. Things weren't working. So we prayed. Not that she would be 28 playing volleyball on a team. We prayed that she would be present with her daughter when her daughter came to visit so they could have the conversations that they could have. That was God's will, right? Not that she revert, go back in time, um, but that this moment could be blessed and could be set apart for them to have a conversation. So the prayers are changed, the prayees are helped, right? And the community, what happened in that house? What happened in that house where Jesus was? Everybody who saw that was amazed. Right? They learned, as Jesus clarified about the sin and the walking, um, they learned that Jesus heals and cures. He does both, all our diseases and ills. God will be praised in the community, and we will grow. Um, as a community, we will grow. Uh, Myongsong Presbyterian Church is in Seoul, Korea. I hope you know about this. It's now the largest Presbyterian church in the world. But in the early 1980s, 40 people got together and prayed every day in the morning for the growth of that church and also for their um, brothers and sisters in North Korea. And they prayed every morning. By 1995, and I don't think they're getting that close to each other right now, but by 1995, they had three prayer services at four, five, and six in the morning. They had to go to three because when they get to 4,000 people, they have to shut the door and start. So they have 12,000 people praying every morning, four, five, and six in the morning, right? So 4,000 of each. And they gather together and they pray. And that church has grown because of prayer. And the Korean church in general is really known for their prayer. If you've ever been to a Salem Presbyterian meeting hosted by one of the Korean Presbyterian churches, they know, they know hospitality well. They have such servant hearts and delicious food, but they are so loving and they pray. That's a terrific example. I want us uh, to practice for just one minute. Here's what I want you to try. This is a different way of intercessory prayer. Um, you don't have to pray specifically. You don't have to use words. If you're willing to try this with me, we'll take a few moments to be still. And Xavier might be a good one for us to lift up. If you could, what, what I'm going to envision is Xavier being held in his mother's arms. Okay, And for that moment to happen, because right now he's in the NICU. She's probably not able to hold him. Um, maybe there's another concern that you have. Okay, But if you can envision what would be God's will in that situation. All right. Is that too weird for you? You got it? Okay. All right. So we'll start with a few minutes of si few moments of silence so you can focus and be still and then I want you to envision that um, healing
Lord, we lift up to you and lower down to you the people that you love, the situations that burden us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen.